cranked it. Okay, so humanities review. We uh, got through uh, um, Egypt. Then remember we mentioned there were basically four civilizations that developed at about the same time. These were the emerging ancient civilizations, as we call them, and they all tended to be developed uh, along what geological areas? <coughs> along the rivers. Yeah, we talked about the importance of the rivers, both in terms of sustenance, you know, having the water that they needed for crops. Because now we have become an, we have become an agricultural based uh, civilization, so we can stay put. Villages are growing up, these civilizations are growing up, but we need water for the plants and agriculture. We need water for our own sustenance. And of course, the rivers also provided what else? I think Travis said last time. Transportation, yeah, it made it possible for us now to, to trade among ourselves. So these are the civilizations. And Egypt was one of the first. Uh, Mesopotamia is the one I want to talk a little bit about today and look at some of the highlights and some of the things that they did. Again, we said that all of these civilizations really depended on strong leadership, uh, strong community support, communal uh, cooperation. And as these civilizations matured, of course, uh, with it they developed a social structure, they developed the moral and ethical ideas, uh, and all of these things became reflected really in the arts and humanities. So this is, I think this was sort of the last slide uh, that we ended up with last time uh, that highlighted the, the growth of these civilizations. So let's take a look at Mesopotamia. We're looking at roughly about uh, 3,500 BCE. And it's in 2000 BC that the Babylonian Empire is established. Now what happens is that out of these civilizations, uh, certain individual parts of them, or uh, individual members of these civilizations, you might say, really establish sort of an empire. I mean, they expand. They go beyond their little village along the Nile or along the, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates River or whatever, and they really develop an, sort of an empire. And their, their um, effects, uh, their culture, the things spread to a large area. So in 200 BCE, the Babylonian Empire is established. Uh, Babylon is the sort of the leading city uh, in Mesopotamia and the Sumer regions. So it's a large city area. It'd be sort of, you know, if we were to compare it, it'd be like, like talking about New York City. I mean, in the fact that it had most of the population there and its impact really uh, extended a large area. Hammurabi was the sixth ruler of this uh, Babylonian empire. And one of the things that was essential, and again sort of a landmark as we talk about the humanities, was he was one of the first to really dis establish a set of rules, uh, actual rules that are written down, and we call that Ham Hammurabi's Code. Okay? The Hebrews are a group of people also living in this area, they're living in Mesopotamia, and they form their political state roughly around 1000 BCE, so a little bit later. And what's unique about the Hebrews is that they develop a new way of looking at a new belief system uh, when, we, when we talk about some sort of an afterlife or when we talk about some sort of divine intervention, divinity, and those kinds of things. And we mentioned before the previous civilizations, Egypt and so forth, up to this point, were polytheistic. And what did we say polytheistic meant? Many gods, yeah, they had many gods, and of course today we talk about mythologies of these different civilizations and things because they had a system of beliefs that incorporated many gods, uh, oftentimes tied closely to nature because they were trying to explain, you know, how nature works and those kinds of things. So they developed that system. But it's the Hebrews that are the first to establish a monotheistic viewpoint. And of course, if polytheism is many gods, monotheism is what? One God. So this, this is where sort of the, uh, we'll talk a little bit later today about the, uh, the four major religions which really sort of begin here. This is the first monotheistic uh, religion that's developed by the Hebrews. And it's unique because of its idea of a belief in one God. It's unique in the fact that it has a belief system that includes a covenant, which is a word which means sort of a contract with God. And their contract is, and their belief system, that if we live according to the rules that God has provided for us, we will have an, some kind of an afterlife, a good afterlife. So that's a covenant, and again, that's a unique idea, uh, sort of a landmark as we talk about these humanities. And, of course, they have the Torah 
the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, which later then really becomes the basis for Judaism, the, the religion that, they, that these uh, Hebrews are practicing. It becomes the basis for Christianity because the first, the Old Testament is really what? Those are the first books of the Judaic Bible. So the, the, the Christian Bible has an Old Testament and a New Testament. And the Old Testament is really uh, the Hebrews belief, the, the Juda Judaistic belief um, in their God system. And then Islam also adopts those early Bibles of the Hebrews as well. Here you see um, the, the Hammurabi's Code, which is etched into this long pillar and was in, uh, in, Babylon, in Babylon, and uh, this would be what it would look like. Now, what's interesting to note, of course, is here's one of the first codes, the first attempt to sort of create some laws that all people can live by. Later, the Hebrews do the same thing, and they develop a set of laws that are very similar to Hammurabi's code, and what do we call those? The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, yeah. I think I mentioned that someplace here, but, but they have also a tablet then which has their Ten Commandments, their basic Ten Laws or Rules to live by, which is again part of the basis of their belief system, and later is adopted in the, the Christian religion as well. Now like Egypt, the gods of Mesopotamia, this is that we're talking about the other aspects of civilization here, the Hebrews have their own city-state, okay, but in Babylon and the rest of the uh, Mesopotamia area, they still have the polytheistic belief. And their gods are tied with the, to the idea of nature. There's a, a way to explain nature. And the Babylonian creation is the earliest written myth that we have that talks about that. It's, it's the first sort of creation myth. Of course, we have creation stories in many different religions, uh, both in uh, uh, the Hebrew, the Judea, uh, Judaism, Christianity has their, their genesis, their, their creation stories, uh, and so did the Mesopotamians. So the Babylonian creation was the earliest recorded creation story, creation myth that we know of. They also were the first, really, to develop literature as we know it today. And when we talk about literature today, and we talk about uh, poems and, and things like that, their first work of literature is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it's the first known, um, because we do have some artifacts that reveal the poem to us, <clears throat> it's the first known epic poem that exists, uh, again, as far as we know, based on the, uh, the, the uh, archaeological evidence. Now, what is an epic poem? What does that epic poem mean? It tells a story, number one. What else? Epic also means what? There's a hero involved, oftentimes, and it's a long poem, yeah. So this is not just a little, you know, couple of verse thing that you'd find. So our poems today, most people like the shorter poems, but this is an epic poem. This is a long story told in a poetic form, uh, and, and it tells the story of Gilgamesh, and he's the hero in the story. It's also the first work that we know of that deals specifically with death and immortality. Again, it, the, the story is the story of Gilgamesh who's trying to understand the world, but trying to find longevity, trying to find immortality. And the evidence also suggests to us that this poem, much like those that we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes of the Greeks and so on, was accompanied by a musical instrument called a lyre. Okay? So this is the first epic poem first story that deals with death and immortality, which of course has since become a, a popular theme in, in uh, many different literary cultures, trying to explain and talk about those ideas. And we believe accompanied then by a musical instrument as well. Okay, um, here's, here's uh, uh, what they think Babylon might have looked like at that time. Again, there is archeological remains, but we don't have the full structure. But you can see here's a thriving city. You, you have an idea of the uh, um, sort of the architecture here. Um, this tall pillar in the background is called a ziggurat. It would be comparable to what the Egyptians would build, their pyramids. It would be comparable to that, only the structure is more square-like as it goes up, rather than a, a, a complete smooth pyramid shape. And this at one time uh, held one of the seven wonders of the world, which were the hanging gardens of Babylon. Now, again, we have no archaeological evidence of those actual gardens existing. All we have is, are some written dec uh, documents that talk about it. But they think is this might be the schematics, again, based on the ruins, what it might look like. 
Now also at this time, which is interesting, because again, we're, we're doing just a snapshot here, so we're kind of taking huge chunks of history at a, at, a, at a moment here, but around 800 BCE, iron is discovered, iron ore. And of course, what can you make with iron? Everything. Everything. Weapons, tools, implements. Uh, before they were using wood, they were using other kinds of materials to try and build things. Now you've got iron, which is a very durable, very strong material. And, of course, as you might imagine, with the development of these tools made possible then uh, war, but also the development of agriculture, and again, the further development of civilizations. This would be a picture of what a, a, a liar from this t time period would look like. Uh, these liars could be very large, like this, uh, like our, really like our modern-day harps that you could sit down and play. Uh, the, Greek, the Greeks kind of compact, these are the first compact disc, you know, the compact the recording device or musical device is the, the portable lyre, which the Greeks uh, devise. Anyway, and then here's, the, here's what a ziggurat would look like. This, again, would be comparable to a uh, pyramid. And so these are, again, some of the landmark humanities things, the architecture of the time, music of the time, art of the time. These are some of the tools and implements. Okay, now we go from this into what is known as the classical age. And this really is the beginning of the humanities as we know it. I mean, they just, they, they take off, they flourish. The classical age, roughly 500 BCE to about 500 CE. So uh, roughly a thousand years we're going to talk about the development of uh, civilization, but particularly, and we're going to focus again on Western civilizations because we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in the East, but there are parallel developments going on uh, in China and in India and other places too. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we, we mention the religion. But in terms of the actual arts and humanities as we know it, it really, really begins to blossom in Greece. This is really the founding point of many of our humanities. Literature, and, and again, these are things that you probably know something about already because you've probably come across some of these things uh, in, in your other studies in, in, uh, in, in public school and so on. So literature, as we know it, really begins here. I mean, outside of the Epic of Gilgamesh, here we have the development of epic poetry. Homer, of course, is the blind poet who recites the poems. They begin as sort of an oral tradition, and he becomes sort of the, the most well-known, anyway, rec uh, recorder and um, a teller of these epic poems. And later they become written down and become sort of the national poems of Greece. And, of course, we know them today. What are, does anyone know some of the poems that uh, Homer's responsible for? The Odyssey, the story of Odysseus, yeah, and the, and the, Trojan, the end of the Trojan War, and of course the Iliad, which is the, the, the Trojan War. These are the two most famous poems, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which talk about the um, adventures of uh, Odysseus and, of course, the, the burning of Troy. And, and, of course, not only have these been very popular stories, even to present day, uh, where you have movies made after these things. In our mythology class uh, last semester, we, we watched the movie Troy, which uh, some of you may have seen. It was a popular Hollywood movie with, uh, with uh, who is the guy? Um, uh, Brad Pitt, you know, and so forth. But a very popular retelling of the, the Trojan War. So literature really, really blossomed here. You also have the development of, of plays, as we know. Theater comes out of the Greek period. So you've got drama, you've got the tragedies and the comedies, which really begin here. Uh, other types of poem, the lyric poem, called lyric because it's accompanied by what? Music. By music, by the lyre, yeah, and you have odes and hymns, and you have epistles, letters that are written that sort of record the events. Oh, wow, philosophy, an entirely new discipline is born here as the Greeks begin to try to look at rational explanations for why things work. The philosophers, the early philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle uh, are, are trying to look at how, how the world works, not in terms of some kind of a supernatural or religious aspect, but more in terms of humanistic, dealing with humans. What, can, what do we do while we're on this earth that can make life better and things of this kind? So the discipline of philosophy really begins in ancient Greece. We also have the development of democratic political and social systems. Um, Athens, the most famous city-state in Greece, uh, really is the very first and probably the only true democracy, I mean 100% democracy, where people had direct votes, 
uh, and they took part in their uh, government. And I mean, it was everyone had took a turn doing different things. You became the public works director, and you did your term. Then it was someone else's turn, and, and the people really participated in that. They were the first ones to use a truly democratic system. And we have since borrowed some of those ideas today, but of course modified them to fit our current needs. The visual arts flourish here, frescoes. Remember we talked a little bit about frescoes last time. Do you remember what a fresco is? What type of a... It's using wet, no, that's the, that's the cuneiform you think about, the but it's using, it's using plaster, wet material, could be clay, but usually plaster, a plaster-like substance uh, that's put on a wall, and then pigment is etched into it, so they would take different colored clays and so forth and create a picture, oftentimes on a wall, using this wet technique, and then, a, then it would dry, so it's a fresco. Pottery continues to do, be developed. Sculpture, we'll take a look at that in a, in a moment, just again, they really become this, the, the, the creators of the standards of what we think of as the visual arts. Uh, they begin really the performance arts, looking at them beyond a ritualistic, other civilizations had dance and music, we, we've mentioned that, but it was done more in terms of a ceremony or ritual. Here they start to look at it as more of a public performance, as a way of expressing ideas and not s strictly tied to uh, the religious beliefs. Architecture, again, huge uh, monuments, civic buildings, religious buildings and temples come out of the uh, Greek civilization. Uh, I, I mean, the, the amount of things that they accomplish are incredible. No other time period since then, uh, with maybe the exception, if you take a look at the modern area when we talk about the advancements of technology and during the time period you people have lived and your, and your grandparents, uh, have we seen such a flourishing of the arts. History, medicine, math, science, even sports, because of course the Greeks developed what? The Olympics. The Olympics. All of these things uh, came out of the Greece civilization. So just a, really an incredible time period in the growth of arts and humanities and things. Here's uh, Socrates, and, and Socrates, he, he told us that we should what? Know thyself. This was part of the idea of the philosophers. Try to understand who we are. Know thyself. Okay. Now, part of what Greece developed is what we call the classic style. When we use the word classic, it really refers all the way back to this Greek period. And it's a, very, it's a, a style that has very specific characteristics. And they will become recognizable to you, particularly the more you, you uh, look at uh, classic art, you'll see these things. Their basic precepts or basic ideas was that the art that they're developing should be clear. They looked at clarity, harmony, it needs to fit in with the setting, and it needs to have proportion, symmetry. None of this modern art at this time, you know, none of these... Uh, uh, strange shapes you'd see in modern art, but very specific proportions, harmony, and clarity. Their focus was on the concept of humanism. And we talked about humanism uh, as it relates to the word humanities here. Humanism w means to focus on human concerns and actions. So the art that they're creating, the sculpture and things, focus on the human uh, physique, the human body, and it shows humans in action or concerned with human activity. So that can be everyday life, it can be sports, obviously, it can be a number of things, but again, it's the focus is on the human body. There also is an attempt to, to uh, focus on what we call realism. They wanted to portray the human form as realistically as possible. So when you think of Greek statues, of course, you, you, you can imagine in your mind, these are, these are human forms that are very close uh, to what a real body would look like. So they really are emphasizing realism. But there's also, as they create these uh, sculptures, they also are striving for perfection. This becomes one of the things they look for. So you, when you look at, it's, it's kind of like, really, you can look, draw a parallel to today when you look at the, the ads on TV, commercials, and in magazines. The human body is portrayed as perfection. You know, they don't show most of us normal people who are, you know, uh, we, we could stand to lose a little weight, and we, you know, we could do some things. But the people that we see in the ads and on commercials are the, you know, perfect people. These are the models and so forth. Well, they, the, the Greeks had the same kind of a thing. They were reaching for perfection in the way they represented um, this, their sculptures. Uh, 
So we'll take a look at that. And then, of course, the materials that they used are unique uh, to this time period. They're, used, they're, they're sculpting out of marble. They're using bronze, gold even, you know, of precious metals. Uh, although, they, of course, they're huge statues themselves. are not made out of gold, but smaller things are. And they use terracotta, a process of taking clay, creating pottery and things, and firing it, uh, painting it, and so on. This would be a perfect example of the classic style. This is Discobolus, the discus thrower. Notice that the proportions are here. You have a, a realistic portrayal of a human throwing a discus. But you also have the, the ideal of the, again, the ideal uh, athlete, sort of the perfect athlete. I mean, th this, this is perfectly proportioned. But notice, and, and this is sculpted, this is carved, and it, uh, I don't know enough about art to know how they do this, but you can see the ribs here, you can see veins in the legs. I mean, it's incredible what they've been able to create out of stone, the sculpture. And again, this was something that, is, uh, that the Greeks perfected. It's the classic style. Okay. Um, we mentioned architecture. Um, you will recognize, of course, some of the uh, ruins of ancient Greece that still exist. This is a model of what the Acropolis looked like, the center of Greece, and the Parthenon, probably the most famous uh, ancient temple, still exists. You can still go to Greece and see. The, uh, they're not in this perfect form, of course, but you can see these things. Uh, the temple of, uh, of Nike, Athena, is down at the bottom here, and a variety of other uh, religious and public buildings. Here would be a perfect example of Greek pottery. Uh, and it's interesting that the Greeks used just basically two different color schemes. They would use this black with sort of an orange or yellow on top of it, and they would use the opposite, sort of a yellow or, back, or, or a yellower uh, uh, background with black figures. Very typical. Uh, another example of Greek sculpture, the perfection of the human body. Uh, using gold, this would be a mask of, uh, this is the mask of Agamemnon shown here. But again, you have the, the, the arts that are used. And of course, in their architecture, they developed some of the stylistic things we still use today. Remember, we talked about the earliest architectural form, uh, like Stonehenge was an example of what? Post and lintel system, yeah. The Greeks continue with that, but of course they refine it. And so they use columns instead of posts, you know, big... Uh, megaliths, they use, they use columns. And the columns are of three kinds, Doric, Ionian, and Corinthian, and each is special to its own case. But they develop a very ornate style of architecture. Okay, now let's talk about the Romans. Those are the Greeks. <coughs> the Romans come a little bit, there's a little bit of overlap here, but their empire, their republic, really comes sort of after the, the Greek republic, or the, the Greek time. And uh, we're really talking about 509, to 133 BC, roughly, is the Roman Republic. <coughs> and uh, there's some similarities here, but also some unique differences. The Romans are a very practical people, much more really practical than the Greeks. The Greeks are idealistic. That's why we have philosophy and we have all these things that kind of emanated from the Greeks. But the Romans are much more practical. And the use of the humanities, as they see it, really has a focus on public utility, public usefulness. They also develop, <coughs> or continue to develop and use, different literary forms. Uh, they really emphasize, even more than poetry, they emphasize prose. And of course, what's the difference between prose and poetry? What's, when we talk about prose, what is prose? Well, prose is writing that's in sentence and paragraph form. That would be prose. So your textbooks are written in prose. When you write a letter, it's in prose. When you write a speech, it's in prose. Okay, that's sort of sentence and paragraph structure. Whereas poetry, as we know, has rhythm, has rhyme, oftentimes has uh, stanzas. I mean, it's, it even looks different. So prose is sort of your standard <coughs> sentence and paragraph structure. So this was really their emphasis. And they excelled in oratory, public speeches. Some of our, f our first great speeches that we know come from the Roman times. Uh, and, uh, and, and you, 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 of course, Shakespeare and others have, have made use of those. So you know Julius Caesar, and you know Mark Anthony's famous speech, very powerful oratory. Uh, and again, letters. They wrote a lot of letters. Cicero wrote letters uh, to, to document what was happening in Rome at the time. The poetry that they used, they did have some epics. We have the Aeneid by Virgil, which tells this, again, another version of the, 
uh, Trojan War, but it's this time from the Roman <coughs> perspective. It's, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, Aeneas, the famous Roman who comes, comes back and actually is credited with founding Rome. That's, uh, again, a, the mythological story told by Virgil in an epic poem. But they have odes and satires. They read, this is the first, you know, those of you that like uh, Saturday Night Live and Comedy Central, all the shows and that and stuff, satire, poking fun at government and things, really began in Roman times. Uh, and satire is a way to make comments about things that are going on in their daily life, but with a, a bit of an edge to it, a hard edge to it. And that really began in Roman times. Um, their philosophy, they really continued the Greek ideas of philosophy. So they, they really didn't have anything new to offer, really. But they did latch on to this, this idea of stoicism, to be stoic. Because stoic had to do with not showing emotions. Uh, someone who is stoic... Uh, works hard. They believe that if they work hard, they'll, they'll be successful. It, there's sort of a work ethic a tied, a tied to Stoicism. And, and so the, the, because of their belief in doing public good, uh, the Romans really latched on to those particular Stoicism and Epicureanism as two philosophical ideas more than really than developing their own philosophies and ideas. And their government was different. Their structure of government was different. They did not believe in a, in a true democracy where the people had a direct vote. Instead, their idea w is res republica, of the people. And of course, what, what is the term that we use today to talk about this kind of government? No, a little different. It's a, it's a type of democracy, but it's, it's a republic. This is a republican form of government. Res publica. How is that different from a true democracy? How is a republican system different than a true democratic system? Mm, yeah, kind of. Our, is our system democratic or a republic? So what's the difference? Do you have direct say in, a direct say in your government? No. Yeah, and, and, and so who makes the decisions for you? That's right. That's the difference. In a, a Republican form of government, you elect uh, leaders who are supposed to do what you say, but they use their own conscience. So you, in our system, we elect, we have a House of Representatives, we have Senators, they do the work for us. We elect them, they're supposed to follow us, but, they, but we individually don't have a direct impact. It has to go through this other body. That's the Republican system. So Rome devised the Senate. We take our idea of a Senate directly from the Romans. The idea that these are elected people who do the bidding of, supposedly, of us. Okay? So it's a little different form of government. It's refined a little bit. They're also one of the first to really try to decide a civil code and to develop a justice system that has legal courts and so forth. Now, they're not the first to devise laws. We talked about the Code of Hammurabi, the Ten Commandments, but they're the first to really develop an overall system that has uh, what we know of today as lawyers and a court system and so on. Again, much of what we have in that area comes from the Romans. In terms of creative arts, um, they copied the Greeks. I mean, they took the Greek statues and they made replicas of them. They're the first to, to really uh, to, to look at. Uh, they, they were so, I guess, uh, their belief system was such that they admired the Greeks that they made copies of them. Their original contribution to sculptures are in the terms of portraits and masks. And we'll see some examples of that. But by and large, in fact, what's interesting, maybe I have that note here too, I can't remember. But by and large, the, uh, the actual um, Greek statues that we know of today uh, the very few that actually exist from Greek times. What we have today are the replicas that were, that were created by the Romans just a hundred or some hundred years later. They did, though, um, um, really excel in the frescoes. They took the art of frescoes to a new level. They developed mosaics. Does anyone know what a mosaic is? Yeah, little broken pieces of things. They actually began with, uh, with stones and things, colored stones, and then taking those and creating a picture from that. That's the idea of a mosaic. And, of course, you can use glass later. Stained glass windows come out of this idea, and uh, we even have mosaics today. We have modern mosaics today that are digitally... In fact, I, I need, to get a, need to get a poster like that. But have you ever seen the posters that are actually made up of little tiny pictures? 
This is the new technology, technological mosaics. So it's, that's the idea of the mosaic. Tiny pieces that when put together create a larger image. Okay, and pottery they take to another level. And the big thing here, notice I got in big bold letters here, what they did really contribute, and this again was a landmark, and we talk about the humanities and we talk about building and so forth, this is a, a landmark move. They created the Roman arch, which now created all kinds of architectural and, and construction possibilities that we didn't have before. Huge contribution is the Roman arch. Um, some examples. We mentioned the sculptures were copies of the Greeks. The, the, the Romans, when they did create sculptures, we said they were portraits. These were usually portraits of officials, rulers, and they were often heroic. So we have a lot of, well, we know what Julius Caesar looked like. We know what Brutus looked like. Mean, we know what their leaders looked like because they made statues of them. And they put them around their empire, around the republic, to remind people of who these, uh, who these leaders are. And we've done the same. We, we've sort of modeled ourselves. We create our, uh, statues of our heroes. We have Lincoln. We've got Washington. You know, think of our founding fathers. There are statues of them all over Washington and other places. So again, we sort of take that idea from the Romance. Uh, they also created these portrait busts uh, made out of marble and bronze and things. Uh, and these, again, were sort of served as what we would consider today sort of like photographs. These were very realistic. In fact, in order to make them so realistic, they actually used life masks, and in some cases death masks, of the person. They would take a wet substance like a plaster or whatever, put it on their face to create a mold, and from that they would be able to create their, uh, their sculpture. So they were very realistic because they were using these masks from their living people as well as those that have died. And finally, we should, we should mention too that the sculptures that they did create as originals were primarily used for memorials, for tributes. Here would be an example of this. This would be, again, a, a, a statue to one of their rulers. Here's a perfect example of a, a portrait bust. How, look how realistic it is. That's because it's from the, the, the mask of the person. Well, I don't know if this was a living or, or death mask, but they would take the actual impression of it and use it for the details. So they created a very realistic type of art. And again, these were often used then for, um, for officials, for <coughs> rulers, but also as memorial tributes. Now, th the interesting thing is, because we're not going to get too much into the socioeconomic side of this, but who do you think could usually afford to have these nice busts made? <coughs> these are the wealthy people, yeah. The, you know, the, the common workers didn't have these kind of tributes, but the wealthy could afford these. So when a, a, a wealthy person died, they would have an artist take the death mask and then create the bust of the person, and that would be, you know, part of their thing. So, okay. Um, Roman architecture. We really need to focus on this just briefly because, again, this is one of the landmark contributions of Rome. Uh, as we mentioned, their focus is on serving the public good. So their architectural forms did that. They had a very utilitarian uh, use. They, they, they served public needs. This really became the, the new technology. The Roman arch was really the new technology of the day. It revolutionized building. It made things possible that before had never been uh, possible in terms of transportation, uh, in terms of uh, how they uh, uh, got their water, for example. Uh, it made those things possible. And these were both public, oftentimes, uh, and religious buildings. They, they created uh, civic buildings as well as temples and things um, to, their, to their Greek gods and whatever. This is probably the most famous one. It's not a particularly good picture, but it's the, the, uh, it's the Pantheon in, uh, uh, in Rome. And you'll notice that it's a combination of the Greek architecture. We've got the columns, sort of the, the, the old post and lintel thing in the foreground, but with the new arch. And of course, what does the arch make possible now? The arch makes possible things like domes, archways, and things like that. So it's a combination of the Roman technique with the Greek technique. That's the Pantheon. Here would be just, again, some quick examples. This is a, would be a fresco. This is what a, a fresco would look like on the wall, all created with plaster. Then the pigment is set in it, and it dries that way. Here's an example of a large mosaic on a wall, again, using uh, broken pieces of stone 
uh, and things to create the image. The other thing that I didn't have on this slide, which you might want to mention too, is that with the, the Romans uh, created cement. I mean, as we know, concrete and cement today, this came out of the Romans. And again, this combined with the arch made possible these buildings and the structural forms that before uh, weren't possible. Does anyone know what this building is? Colosseum, Colosseum in Rome. Yeah, the Colosseum, uh, of course, and again, using the Roman arch and the architecture. And if we were to look down inside of it, the Colosseum was used for what? For a variety of events. I mean, it was a lot of things. It included sports events. Uh, so they had chariot races and things in here. It's, it was the first arena, as we know it today, this first sports complex. And, of course, we, mod we model our modern-day arenas and things after the Colosseum. When you go to watch a football game, you go into a stadium. This is what it's modeled after. But it was also used, again, for some torturous kinds of things, too. During the Christian era, you know the stories of the, the gladiators. Maybe you've seen the movie Gladiator, too. But those that were opposed to the Roman rule uh, were imprisoned and made to fight one another. So this Colosseum was used over the centuries for a number of things. But the architectural uh, form, again, is magnificent. Does anyone know what this is? This picture here, with all these little arches. Does anyone know what that is? It looks like a bridge. It's not a bridge, but it looks like one. And, and they would use the arches for developing bridges. It's a waterway. Do you know what you call when you transport water from the mountains down into Rome? What's that called? That's called an aqueduct. That's an aqueduct. So they were the first to develop this huge system of transporting water from the mountains down into the flatlands through these aqueducts. So these are pipes, in a sense. These are, these are all created out of stone and cement and stone, pipes that are held up by the arches and then move along um, hundreds of miles to bring the water. It doesn't go through the arches. No, and actually, uh, they're sort of like a, um, well, what would you call it? It's not a, a pipe system, but it's like a trough. It's like a trough on top. So the water goes down the trough and right into the, and it goes out hundreds of miles down into the city. Uh, for, again, a, a, a tremendous development that the arch made possible to do these kinds of things. Okay. Now let's, let's shift again. We're, we're jumping again uh, ahead, so we, we don't, we're not spending a lot of time on, on all of these things, but we need to give you the overall perspective. So really the humanities, as we know them, really developed with the Greeks and Romans in this classical period. Well, now we enter the Middle Ages, what is called the Middle Ages. And as you know, as you remember your history, you know, a Roman Empire is created, there's turmoil, people are killed, there's war, there's always war going on and throughout history, of course. Um, but it's out of this time period, which the Middle Ages used to be called the Dark Ages. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to that. But it's out of this time period that the major <coughs> monotheistic religions take root. Okay, the major religions as we know them today, start at this time, roughly 500 to 1,000. Now we're, now we're getting into the modern area. Up until this time, the, most of the religions, as we would call them, were polytheistic beliefs, meaning many gods. But now, four major monotheistic beliefs develop. Judaism, we already mentioned that. The Hebrews were the first, the first ones to do this. That's the oldest one. But now we have this upstart, Jesus of Nazareth, who has a bunch of followers, and out of his belief system comes Christianity. And we have another upstart in India, Siddhartha, and out of his rebellion comes Buddhism. And in the, main, in the meantime, we have Hinduism and Islam developing. And these are still, today, really, our four major monotheistic religions. And out of these, of course, have come many other branches. As, as many of us know, in the Midwest, in the, in the United States, uh, Christianity has many branches. Some of you may be Lutherans, you may be Catholics, you may be Protestants, you may be Episcopalians, you may be other things as well. But out of each of these then comes, of course, many different branches. But these are the four major monotheistic religions. Judaism, as we mentioned, is the oldest living religion in the West. Christianity became an alternative to the secular and rational values of classical culture. Remember, the Greeks and Romans really valued uh, the idea of, of secularism, public good, and they really focused on trying to understand things from a rational standpoint. Christianity became an alternative to that, a new way of looking at things. 
realizing that my life is temporary. I'm on this earth for a short time. I will really live most of my time in heaven or in some kind of an afterlife. So it's a different belief system, a different way of looking at things that comes out of these religions, and particularly Christianity. One Jewish preacher who is a rebel, Jesus, leads the way in terms of Christianity. He breaks away from uh, the, the harsh rules and some of the things uh, that are going on in the, the Jewish faith. And he, he himself is Jewish, but he breaks away from that and begins to develop, of course, what we know as today uh, as Christianity. The pursuit of reason and earthly wisdom gives way to the promise of messianic deliverance and eternal life. What does the word messianic mean? You know the word. You know, you know the word Messiah, for example, messianic. The idea that somebody will come and help mankind, save mankind. A Messiah will come. This is part of the the idea here that there will be some kind of a promise of some kind of an afterlife, a deliverance from our hardships, from our sins, and some kind of a promise of eternal life, an eternal good life, somewhere else. These are the ideas that that really people begin to focus on, and they begin to break away from the ideas of reason, earthly wisdom, and, and uh, sort of only focus on life here on earth. As Christianity begins to win these converts, and more and more people look towards Christianity um, within the Roman Empire, meanwhile, there's a parallel development here going on in the East, and which one is that? What would you, th you think? This is Buddhism. Siddhartha Gautama, he, he is very, in fact, it's interesting because there's, there's strong parallels between the development of Christianity and Buddhism. He also is rebellious. He rebels against the Hindu faith, just as Jesus rebelled against the Jewish faith. And just as Jesus became known as the what? Messiah. The Messiah or the Christ, Jesus Christ, uh, Siddhartha became known as Buddha, the Enlightened One. So this very fascinating parallel cell. And, and if you, you know, you, religion is just one of the many humanities. And you might take a, a advanced courses later in your college career that focus on the study of religions. So Christianity is spreading throughout the Holy Roman Empire, which is primarily Europe. If you, if you visualize a map in your mind, think of Europe all the way up to Norway, all the way down to just about to Spain, all the way, of course, in Italy and Greece and so forth. This is the Holy Roman Empire, and Christianity is spreading in this area. Okay? Meanwhile, Buddhism is spreading from India, where it begins, it really is a break away from Hinduism. So Buddhism is spreading away from India into Tibet, into Mongolia, and into what we know as China today. So it's spreading eastward, and Christianity is going westward. And then the other two religions we talked about, Hinduism, really remains pretty much in India. That becomes the focal point for it. So again, if you visualize the map, India is basically Hinduism. And Islam, the other major religion, uh, is in Turkestan, Arabia, Egypt. And of course, we know a lot about, we talk about Islam today because of the war that we're involved in with Iraq. So there is a whole different religious uh, belief system than what most people have in, uh, in uh, the West, which is primarily uh, Christian. Sure. And of course, as you can imagine, as a, a belief systems these large begin to spread, you know, as more and more people decide to join uh, these religious uh, beliefs, along with these belief systems, and it's, the arts are impacted, right? How can they not be? So the, the different types of artistic things that they develop uh, begin to resemble, begin to symbolize, begin to reveal their belief systems in these various religions. Now, I think I've got a footnote here I should add, one more footnote, yeah. Um, NB is, uh, Latin means nota bene, means notes, carefully, that these, Christianity and Buddhism are developing at the same time. But in terms of the life of the two prophets, Jesus was actually born, roughly, they, they think, anywhere from 150 to 300 years after Buddha. 
after Siddhartha. So even though they didn't live at exactly the same time periods, their religious, the, the followers of their religious beliefs, were developing at the same time. So it took Buddhism a little longer to catch on. Christianity spread and caught on much faster. But they're both developing at about the, the same time uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages. Okay. Um, similarities, just to, just to identify a couple similarities. Jesus is known as the Christ. Siddhartha is known as the Buddha. Both represent um, the leaders of their particular religions. Both of them are breakaways from the older established faiths. Christianity is a breakaway from Judaism. Buddhism is a breakaway from Hinduism. Both of them, and one of the reasons why they were so popular and why they developed, they promised redemption from sin. They promised the idea of a, a, an afterlife. Something better will happen after we live our life here. They were inclusive. What does that mean, inclusive, that term? Who could be part of the Christian movement? Everyone. Previous religions had a sort of a socioeconomic thing. You know, you, you kind of had to buy your way in or you had to be pretty well to do to be considered part of that religious movement or that religious group. Both of these had very common roots. They were inclusive. Anyone could believe in Christianity and be a practitioner. Anyone can practice Buddhism. It's not for only the wealthy. It's for all people. And that was a very powerful thing at that time. They had rules that were simple and easy to follow. The, the established religions eventually developed this very uh, law, laborious and very long and detailed list of rules you had to follow. And sometimes you had to pay for certain things. Uh, of course, later Christianity, certain religions of Christianity start to, you know, Luther, Lutheranism is a breakaway from Catholicism. I mean, you've got things that start to happen here. So it's the same kind of a thing. There were easy rules to follow. Uh, there was this idea of compassion for all people. It was a very... Um, something that a lot of people could believe in and follow. And the other thing that is big difference here is that both Jesus and Buddha lived on the earth. People saw them. They actually practiced what they preached. Whereas the other religious beliefs oftentimes didn't have one particular person who they could look at as someone who was, who was practicing what they said, practiced what they preached, so to speak. So you have these two religions that are developing at the same time period in the Middle Ages. Even though they're, they have many similarities, and of course they have differences, but it's interesting how similar they are. Both Christianity and Buddhism influenced the arts. They had a tremendous impact on them. And as you can imagine, the arts reflected then religious symbols, stories from both uh, of these religions, the icons that were used, uh, and they had predominant themes that were reflected in the arts. Architectural works became, that, that were made again during the, the Middle Ages here, were primarily religious buildings, mostly churches and temples. And in terms of the, the Christian, Christianity, it's interesting that they took many of the Roman ideas and converted them to their use. So we have what, at what time were the Roman basilicas and baths, sort of public areas. Uh, the Christian architects of this time take those ideas and use them as they create their, their uh, churches. So they take the Roman arch, the Roman techniques, and they adapt them now to these new religious structures. They take the pagan holidays, as you, I think most of you know, uh, Christmas, for example, and some of our other holidays, they go way back, they go way back to pagan holidays. We, we don't know exactly when, when Christ was born. No one knows. It just so happens that, that uh, December 25th, that time period, was also a, a popular pagan holiday. So these religious things, as they began to convert and people converted to them, they took some of the old and they made it new. They adapted them to fit their new ideas and things. So you see the, uh, the iconography that happens here. The, the art of this time period becomes very religious. We have the saints uh, represented. We have you know, all religious figures represented and a lot of symbolism. The cross develops this time as a major Christian symbol, for example. Here would be some other examples of how um, it influenced. Writing that has happened at this time. Uh, 
it, it becomes illuminated is the term that we use. So we have uh, documents that now have uh, drawings on them from, with ink that have Christian symbolism. Uh, the sculptures that th at that time, uh, again, reflect Christian beliefs. The buildings using uh, the Romanesque domes and Romanesque arches and things begin to be used for churches and those kinds of things. And even precious <coughs> artifacts, everyday artifacts, things that you might store, things, trunks and whatever, take on a religious significance as they have the symbols of, in this case, the Christian symbols of Christ, the apostles and things like that. So in terms of the humanities, religion plays a huge part, not only in that religion is a humanities itself, but the influence of it impacts the arts of the time and the architecture of the time. Okay, uh, we're going to end there for today. Any questions on those? Again, sort of a quick overview. We'll do the last, uh, we'll, we'll bring us right up to the uh, uh, period on Tuesday. So go ahead and read, it, read into chapter 1. And we'll probably be starting that towards the end, maybe, of class on Tuesday, but uh, Thursday will be our, our introduction to the book, chapter one.